Good afternoon, colleagues. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the portfolio on this occasion is social justice. Anyone looking to uh, ask a supplementary question should press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question. Uh, the usual plea for brevity in both questions and answers uh, goes. And I call question number one, uh, Ben McPherson. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of the Housing Cladding Remediation Scotland Act 2024 and Cladding Remediation Programme, including the Scottish Safer Buildings Accord and Single Building Assessment Pilot Programme. Minister Paul McLean. Uh, with the Act and SBA technical specification now in place, we are able to accelerate the pace of delivery. We will shortly provide a timetable for commencement of the Act, prioritising the powers that are urgently needed including the completion of the SBA standards to sit alongside the technical specification already published. Pilot assessments have been undertaken for 30 of the pilot entries, with works to mitigate or remediate risks having started on five of these pilot entries. We continue to work with developers to agree a contract, ensuring developers can play their part in speeding up progress. Ben McPherson. I, of course, welcome the progress made through passing the Act and what the Minister has set out and appreciate the very complex work being done by Scottish Government officials on this issue. But many of my constituents remain frustrated with the lack of progress and clear information coming from both the Government and developers on their particular buildings. Therefore, can the Minister provide further insight of when my constituents will start to receive more regular, clear, proactive information on when remediation may start on their buildings and when started on progress thereafter. Minister. I thank the member for that question and I'm grateful for his continuing commitment to his constituents on these issues. We are taking a number of steps to improve communications with residents. A regular newsletter, improvement to the content and detail of the Scottish Government website, frequent engagement through the High Rise Action Scotland Group and the development of a pre-assessment charter. Where we are shortly going to be undertaking refreshing pilot SBA assessments, we now have the legislative and robust technical basis to do so. We will be writing to relevant owners and occupiers to inform them. The Act uh, ensures we must undertake pre and post uh, engagement. I am happy to meet the member to give him a detailed update on developments within his constituency. And briefly, Willie Rennie. I would have expected a bit of a greater urgency on this because Scotland was quite far behind the curve already, certainly compared with the rest of the United Kingdom. I would have expected the frustration that Ben McPherson talked about to have communicated to the sector and to the government and to have swifter action. So what is the Minister going to do within the next few weeks to make sure we get some progress? Because we're going to have this frustration for much longer if he doesn't. Minister. Yeah, can I thank the member for his question? We had a meeting this morning and I've got a meeting with colleagues this afternoon to talk about that very issue. Uh, Mr Rennie, in, in terms of that, obviously we mentioned about the cladding act that was brought forward, which gives us uh, additional powers to, to uh, obviously ensure developers move at a quicker pace uh, and so on. So we'll continue to undertake uh, meetings with developers. We'll continue to meet with officials to, to pick up on that pace. I know it needs to get quicker and we've acknowledged that uh, and we will be and, uh, making sure that moves at a quicker pace. Question two, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of reports of almost 10,000 children living in temporary accommodation and 110,000 households on the waiting list for affordable social housing, what progress it has made towards providing these affected with safe and affordable accommodation? Minister Paul McLennan. Uh, from the 23rd of March 22 to the 31st of March 24, 21,092 homes have been delivered towards the 110,000 affordable homes target, of which 15,000 964, which is 76%, are homes for social rent. We will invest nearly £600 million in affordable housing in 24-25, the majority of which will be for social rent. This includes uh, up to £40 million to increase affordable housing supply and to acquire properties to reduce the number of households, especially with children, in temporary accommodation. We will also provide £2 million in 24-25 to local authorities experiencing sustained temporary accommodation pressures to support existing housing stock management and minimise void turnaround. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for that response. Scotland continues to be in the grip of a devastating housing emergency, and despite the Scottish Government's commitment to tackle this national crisis, there has been a 10 per cent increase in households becoming homeless compared to last year. Every 16 minutes a household becomes homeless, and every day 45 children become homeless. 
What does the Minister have to say to the response to these thousands of people without anywhere to call home? Minister. The Scottish Government obviously recognises there are exceptionally challenging times. You mentioned, um, I think, about the, the challenges, uh, probably primarily in, in some of the cities that we have, Glasgow and Edinburgh. So I, I meet with them on a regular basis, and we're obviously taking action to reduce homelessness and improve the site in supply of social and affordable housing. We have uh, met with the Housing Coalition uh, on a number of occasions and are working with them um, um, on, on a number of occasions and, uh, with myself and the, and the Cabinet Secretary in regard to that. So we'll continue to meet with them to try and focus in on some of the points um, on, on that. So as I said, we're looking at the £600 million pounds that we've, we've delivered. We're working very closely with local authorities, specifically working with them in terms of what they need and the housing emergency action plans that they bring forward in terms of that. But it, it's, it's partnership working we need at all levels as well. So obviously we need to speak to UK government uh, in terms of that and local government as well as the housing sector uh, partners that we're continuing to, to focus on. But there's, there's a, a long number of meetings and actions that we're taking out from these meetings that we've been having. Thank you. A couple of supplementaries, hopefully briefly. First, uh, Colette Stevenson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As well as the Scottish Government's record on the delivery of social and affordable housing since 2007, can the Minister detail how the proposed housing bill will build on Scotland's already UK-leading homelessness prevention policies and help to avoid the stigma and adverse childhood experiences caused by not having a safe place to call home? Minister. Yeah, the new homelessness prevention duties in the Housing Bill are groundbreaking, involving those in areas such as health and justice, and a shared public responsibility to prevent homelessness right through the new Ask and Act duties. We have been told by those with lived experience of homelessness of the missed opportunities to prevent homelessness through earlier intervention, and we are determined to address that. Earlier intervention by a range of services and by local authorities to prevent homelessness can mean less households with children having to go through the trauma, stigma and disruption to their lives brought by homelessness, as well as easing pressures on housing supply. We continue to work with stakeholders to ensure we have the right guidance in place for implement implementing these new duties. And briefly, Emma Roddick. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be aware of projects in my region which hope to make use of the Rural and Islands Housing Fund to develop new homes, including in island communities where two homes can have the same impact as dozens elsewhere. Can he speak to the availability of this fund and support that is available to local housing providers to make use of it in the coming months and years? Briefly as possible, Minister. Yeah, we remain committed to delivering 110,000 affordable homes by 2032, for which at least 10 per cent will be in rural and highland communities supported by a Rural and Islands House and Action Plan. As well as considerable mainstream investment, support is also available through the demand-led £30 million Rural and Island Housing Fund and the £25 million Rural Affordable Homes for Key Workers Fund. Between April 2016 and March 2023, we have helped to deliver over 10,000 homes in rural and island areas and invested more than £839 million. Thank you. Question three, Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment the Ministerial Task Force on Population has made of the reported population increase in Edinburgh and the South East, including any proposals that it has made to address this since it was established in June 2019. Minister Kokab Stewart. Thank you. The Scottish Government's population strategy, which was published in 2021, includes a more balanced work strand, focusing on ensuring our population is sustainable, uh, sustainably distributed. This work strand recognises the pressures of both population growth and depopulation. Last year, our Ministerial Population Task Force considered exploratory research to expand our evidence base with regards to the drivers and challenges of population growth. The findings of which will inform future policy development. And we continue to work closely with local authorities, um, COSLA, our members of the Population Programme Board, and jointly chair the Local Government Population Roundtable. Miles Briggs. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? We're seeing a historic a shift in population in Scotland from west to east. By 2040, Lothian councils are set to see the largest percentage increase in our populations. Midlothian projected to see an increase of over 30% in its population. So we need to see the Scottish Government and public bodies able to plan now for the increased pressures our public services will face. As I say, 84% of Scottish population growth is due to be based here in my region in Lothian 
Odium over the next 10 years. And so it's time for ministers to understand that we need to plan for that population growth and development. So can I ask the minister um, if she will agree to take forward a cross-party summit with MSPs and public bodies so we can look now at the future challenges and opportunities which will face public services across the Lothian region? Minister. Um, I thank Miles Briggs for that. Uh, work is ongoing. We do take this very, very seriously, and our population programme considers the challenges of population growth, as I mentioned. Um, it has been a key consideration for the Population Roundtable, which, as I said, is already jointly chaired by the Scottish Government and COSLA and representatives from all local authorities. I would be happy to meet with Mr Briggs to discuss the issues that he raises in more detail, and the Ministerial Task Force will continue to consider how we can take appropriate steps to address these challenges in collaboration with key partners such as local authorities, which we already are doing. Thank you. And brief supplementary, Ben McPherson. The, the huge population growth in Edinburgh is having an effect on both rental and purchasing house prices, understandably. Because of this population growth, are there specific actions that the Scottish Government is taking to address this issue in Edinburgh? And can a prioritisation be given to Edinburgh in terms of the £600 million of funding that I saw provided for affordable housing in the programme for government? Mr. Our affordable housing supply programme investment in Edinburgh has been at a record level over the first three years of the Parliament at £160 million. The allocation for the City of Edinburgh for this financial year is £34.9 million. Nationally, efforts to boost affordable housing supply by acquiring properties to bring into use for affordable housing and help reduce homelessness have been given an uplift of £80 million over the next two years, and we have allocated a further £14.8 million to Edinburgh, raising the allocation to the city this year to over £49 million. And we recognise Edinburgh Council's strong track record of affordable housing delivery and continue to work very closely to maximise affordable housing. A key question for Paul O'Kane. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of its pre-budget fiscal update on the 3rd of September, what the potential impact will be of its review and profile of recruitment at Social Security Scotland on the agency's provision of frontline services to clients. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. The Scottish Government requested all public bodies to identify savings options to balance the 2024-25 Scottish Budget. The review and reprofiling of recruitment in Social Security Scotland has protected and prioritised the provision of critical frontline services to clients, which remains the agency's and the Government's top priority. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and she will recognise that the most recent workforce statistics have shown that following the growth of staffing in Social Security Scotland that those uh, figures have largely stabilised at approximately 3,800. But we also know that despite that there have been issues ongoing with service revision, long processing times, long call waiting times and complexities in the system and those issues have been well debated in the Chamber. Indeed we have seen progress but can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that we will see no detrimental impact of this decision in terms of that progress? that is being made. Cabinet Secretary. Happy to give that reassurance to Paul O'Kane, Presiding Officer. The agency has uh, reassessed their staffing requirements across the year, and that's about ensuring that they fill the vacancies at the right time. And the updated recruitment plans take account of the seasonal peaks in benefit delivery and the additional staff required to deliver pension age disability payment. But I can assure Mr O'Kane that absolutely both for myself, the Chief Executive, eh, and indeed everyone that working at the agency, we are absolutely determined to maintain the performance levels because he is quite right to point out that call waiting times and eh, processing time for some benefits eh, were too long. We have seen improvements in that and we are determined to stay that. And supplementary, Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. With regards to the frontline provision of services by Social Security Scotland, can the Cabinet Secretary advise of the need to mitigate against Labour's bedroom tax and benefit cap is taking away resources that could be spent on further enhancing Social Security provision in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member raises a, a very, very important uh, point, and uh, she will know, of course, that the Scottish Government spends around £134 million this year mitigating uh, this UK Government's welfare, uh, welfare package, uh, and that totals £1.2 billion since 2013. The presiding officer, there are many ways that the Scottish Government would like to spend uh, that money, of course. So, for example, this year's uh, mitigation alone would pay for 2,000 teachers 
teachers uh, or by fund, uh, Band 5 nurses. It then demonstrates the difference it could make in education, it could make the difference in uh, the NHS or indeed on other anti-poverty measures, including those uh, delivered by Social Security Scotland. Question 5, Willie Coffey. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what impact its national mission to tackle child poverty is having in the Kilmarnock Carnarvon Valley constituency. Cabinet Secretary. We are providing a range of support which will benefit families in Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley and across Scotland, including the investment in our game-changing Scottish child payments, early learning and childcare, and free bus travel for under-22s. Between February 2021 and this year, our Scottish child payment has made more than 157,000 payments worth over £22 million uh, to low-income families in East Ayrshire. East Ayrshire will also be one of the five new Fairer Futures partnerships with Kilmarnock, a key area of focus, ensuring services are integrated to help families where and when they need it. Early coffee. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and further to those figures. Nearly 9,000 children in East Ayrshire are getting help from the SNP Government to keep them out of poverty. Over 100,000 payments totalling £13 million makes a big difference. Contrast this with the attacks by the Tories and continued by Labour to keep in place the two-child benefit cap that will mean thousands more children living in poverty that could have been freed from it. Nearly 10 years on from our country's vote on independence, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that Scotland and Scotland's children can't put up with the damage caused by the Union anymore? And will she continue to work hard to lift children out of poverty with every means at her disposal? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, Mr Coffey is quite right uh, to link the work that this government continues to do on uh, our anti-poverty, particularly to eradicate children's poverty, but also the limitations of uh, the current uh, devolution uh, settlement. Uh, he's quite right also to point out, for example, from data published by the End Child Poverty Coalition in December 2023, that one in ten, more than one in ten families, in fact, in East Ayrshire are impacted by the two-child limit, with families losing up to £3,455 uh, £3, each year for every affected child. That was uh, the Tory UK government's policies. That is now the Labour UK government's policies. And Mr Coffey is quite right that under independence there would be no such policy uh, with the SNP. Question 6, Annabelle Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Fife Council regarding the impact of its housing adaptation policy. Minister Paul McLean. The Scottish Government has not had any recent discussions with Fife Council regarding their housing adaptations policy. However, we are taking forward a review of the policy and delivery arrangements of the current housing adaptation systems and will seek views from councils and other stakeholders. I expect to receive initial recommendations on how best to improve and streamline the system and maximise the impact of investment before the end of 2024. Annabel Ewing. I thank the Minister for his answer. It is important, however, for the Minister to know what is happening on the ground. And the fact of the matter is that far too many of my constituents wait far too long for even the most basic of adaptations to be made to their homes by Five Council. This means that some cannot wash themselves properly and some cannot even access a toilet and need to use a commode, in some cases for years. Does the Minister agree with me that this is simply unacceptable in 21st century Scotland? And will he now take up this breach of people's right to dignity with the Chief Executive of Fife Council with a view to the Council sorting this continuing shambles out once and for all? Minister. Adaptations make an important contribution to supporting older people and disabled people to live safely and the members right to, to raise these points and of course they need to be comfortable and independent at home. I note some of your constituents are currently waiting for ad adaptations uh, for their home. My House officials will discuss this matter with Fife Council and get back to yourself. And Bruce Supplementary, on the basis this is around Fife Council from Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In July, I was contacted by Andrea, who cares for her two disabled daughters. Her home requires adaptions, but is not large enough for the daughter's wheelchair or uh, specified bed recommended by the physio. Her housing association will not extend the house and has no suitable homes available. Another housing association refuses to fit drop shower. 
How is the Scottish Government working to ensure housing associations and local authorities uphold their duties to provide essential adaptions, including beds? I'm not sure this is around five council, but Minister, if you wish to respond as yeah, far as you can. If the member can write to me, I'm happy to pick that up for him and I'll get officials to contact him on, on that. Thank you very much. Question seven, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government regarding any impact on the administration of Scottish Social Security benefits, what information it holds on the percentage of pensioners in Scotland that have not claimed pension credit for which they are eligible? Cabinet Secretary. As pension credit is reserved to the UK Government, we are reliant on DWP statistics on take-up rates. The latest available covering the financial year 21-22 show that the take-up rate of pension credit overall in Great Britain is 63 per cent, but they do not show different rates for the countries or regions. 125,136 households receive pension credit in Scotland, which suggests that around 75,000 households in Scotland are eligible for pension credit but are not receiving it. Karen Adam. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can I ask, with the estimates showing up to um, thousands of families who are entitled to receive pension credit not being able to claiming the benefit, with Labour MPs at Westminster also voting this week to remove the winter fuel payment for millions of pensioners, what more can the Scottish Government do to increase benefit uptake and ensure our eligible pensioners receive the support they so desperately need this winter? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. The decision um, on winter fuel payment was one which originated with the UK Government, and therefore it is absolutely imperative that they undertake a benefit take-up uh, campaign. And I have asked the Secretary of State uh, to do so, and to do so urgently. Scottish Government officials are working with the DWP and indeed stakeholders to promote pension credit take-up, despite this uh, solely being a reserved benefit. Our welfare advice services supported, supported by Scottish Government investment are also working very closely with people who may be entitled to benefits devolved or reserved but have not yet applied. These efforts include increasing awareness and take-up assistance to support people who are struggling financially. That is why we have committed to investing over £20 million for the provision of free income maximisation support, welfare and debt advice services in 2024-25. Craig Hoy. I thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much it estimates it will cost to fund the minimum income guarantee scheme proposed in the Minimum Income Guarantee Expert Group Interim Report. Cabinet Secretary. The Independent Minimum Income Guarantee Expert Group's interim report set out some very important principles for their work and they are currently undertaking further development to consider both costs and delivery. On that basis, the Scottish Government is not yet in a position to make any cost estimates given we have not had that final report. We remain ambitious in looking at innovative ways to tackle poverty and inequality and so look forward to receiving the recommendations later this year. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Cross party strategy group for their continued support with this work, which of course includes Miles Briggs. Craig Hoy. I, th I thank the Minister for that answer. According to the Scottish Government, under a minimum income guarantee, and I quote, everyone in Scotland would have a minimum income regardless of their circumstances, with the IPPR suggesting that this could come at a cost of £7 billion per year. Given that the Scottish Government can't put lunch on the table for primary six and primary seven pupils, and is set to rob pensioners of the money to heat their homes, shouldn't the Minister now level with the public, and shouldn't she be very cautious of the costs and the complexity of any such scheme, and instead perhaps focus on a growth-based economy with a fair and focused welfare system at its heart. Cabinet Secretary. You know what I'm really aware of, President Officer, is the cost and the benefits, of which the benefits are none, of the £1.2 billion that this government pays for the 14 years of austerity mitigating some of the UK government's welfare policies, now adopted by UK Labour as well. And I will make no apology, President Officer, for the fact that this government will continue to look at innovative ways of tackling poverty. Mr Hoy may be quite happy to leave those people behind, and I am not. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions on social justice. There will be a brief pause before they move to the next item of business to allow front benches to change. <laughs>